Wiltshire sits in the very heartland of rural England. Part of the county falls within the ancient kingdom of Wessex, Thomas Hardy country. Lying in the midwest of England, the northern edge of the county nudges into the Cotswold Hills. The whole county is liberally sprinkled with archaeological, architectural, historical and spiritual sites, making Wiltshire one of the most historically rich counties in England. But of all of Wiltshire, or even England's great ancient monuments and sites, few can rival the jewel in the crown that is Avebury. There are in excess of 900 known stone circles throughout the length and breadth of the country, and they vary enormously in completeness and size. But, set in the rolling chalk downs of North Wiltshire, and with a diameter of around 1400 feet, Avery stands alone as the largest Neolithic stone circle in Europe. So how do you begin to tell the story of this magnificent place? Well, building work probably began some 4,000 years ago. That's about the same time that the pyramids were being built in ancient Egypt. Construction wouldn't have been swift, possibly a couple of hundred years from start to finish, but some of this would have been embellishments and further development rather than primary construction. The first building work undertaken was likely to have been the ditch and bank, or henge, surrounding what was going to be the stone circle itself. Working with simple tools, like these replicas of an antler pick and an ox shoulder blade shovel, vertical pits or shafts would have been sunk into the chalk soil in a circle. Then, teams of labourers would have quarried to link these pits together, thus forming the ditch with the chalk spoil being carried up in wicker baskets to form the bank. Excavations carried out on the Great Ditch in 1922 revealed the original depth to have been a staggering 9 metres, and the bank above to have been nearly 7 metres tall. That's the height of three double-decker buses. This 16 metre difference would have made the Henge a highly impressive sight, particularly as then it wouldn't have been covered in grass as it is today, but instead standing out starkly in white chalk. Following on from the construction of the bank and ditch, between 160 and 180 greyweather, or sarsen stones, were carefully positioned within the newly formed circle. The stones, weighing anything from 20 to 60 tonnes, would have been hauled on rollers from the nearby Marlborough Downs, and then levered into specially dug sockets in precise locations. A large outer circle was built of 98 stones from 3 to 6 metres high together with two inner circles and other features. The outer circle probably had four entrances, each one flanked by large portal stones. Many of the stones are missing today, but three large portal stones remain. And thanks to extensive reconstruction work in the southwest and northwest sectors, it's possible to appreciate something of the original splendour of the circle. This stone, which lies in the northeast sector, has not been re-erected, but lies where it fell, or was toppled by man. When you're this close to one of the outer circle stones, it makes you begin to appreciate just how much effort would have been needed to move them. The northern inner circle, consisting originally of some 27 stones, also contains a feature made up of three large stones known as the cove, although only two stones remain today. These are some of the largest at Avebury, being over seven metres tall. The southern inner circle of 29 stones contained an irregular or Z-shaped feature of about a dozen stones together with a large central pillar or obelisk. The antiquary William Stukeley noted it, before it was broken up, as being 21 feet tall and 8 feet 9 inches in diameter. Its purpose is unknown, but some research has given it astronomical significance. In the 19th century, 
This spot found new purpose as the site for a maypole. In the same sector of the circle stand the two massive portal stones marking the southern entrance to the circle. Close to these two stands the remaining stump of a stone known as the ring stone. This was initially a stone with a hole laboriously cut through it, but the original stone is believed to have been replaced, still in Neolithic times, with this sarsen stone, which had a natural hole through it. It probably resembled this surviving ring stone at Madron, near Penzance in Cornwall. Archaeologists have built up a reasonably accurate picture of how the stone circle was built. But when it comes to why, the answer is a bit more complex. Although the number of people living locally was reasonably high, an estimated 10,000 people in the Marlborough Downs area at the time, something had to motivate a large enough workforce to leave their daily routine for this hugely labour-intensive task. Avery Stone Circle doesn't stand alone, but is inextricably linked to four other sites all built by Neolithic man within a two-mile radius of the Stone Circle. The first of these is Windmill Hill. It's the largest Neolithic enclosure known. The site is encircled by three concentric ditches, constructed up to 1,200 years earlier than Avebury Stone Circle. At 6,000 years old, that predates the pyramids by quite a big margin. The hill is located just over a mile to the northwest of Avebury. So close that any link between the two sites cannot be coincidental. This remarkable site wasn't discovered until the early part of the 20th century, when a local clergyman found pottery and flint tools. In the 1920s, a talented amateur archaeologist, Alexander Keeler, fortunately being a man of some means, bought the site to prevent its destruction. He then spent four years excavating it, using techniques considered extremely advanced for their day. It's hard to make out the features of this remarkable encampment at ground level, other than as a meaningless jumble of small bumps and ditches. Fortunately, much archaeological work has been done in the area and allows us to see the layout of the site in diagrammatic form. The outer ditch was in excess of two metres deep, the middle one some one and a half metres, and the inner one just under one metre deep. These ditches would have been constructed by Neolithic man using the same simple tools we saw earlier. Outside the outer bank is a square 9 metre by 9 metre enclosure, which may be the remains of a wooden building. The use the hut was put to also remains a mystery, but it may have had significance for burial ritual or have been a simple cattle pen. Artifacts recovered from the site are now housed in the local museum. These have helped historians build up a much clearer view of life in this part of Britain in about 3700 BC. The exact purpose behind Windmill Hill has provoked many theories, and comparisons between it and other hilltop enclosures have proved surprisingly fruitless, as few common denominators can be found. Other hilltop enclosures have been readily identified as forts, simple living places or burial sites. Some of the material recovered has indicated that the site was used seasonally in the spring and autumn for butchering animals. Other relics indicate possible use for markets, meetings, feasting and general social interaction, possibly between different tribes. The discovery of human remains on Windmill Hill has led to speculation over the site's ritual significance to a largely peaceful and prosperous community of farmer hunter-gatherers. At about the same time that Windmill Hill was being built and occupied, the hand of Neolithic man was altering another part of the local landscape. Standing on the crest of a low hill near the hamlet of West Kennet is another monumental Neolithic construction, West Kennet Long Barrow. At only one and a half miles to the south of Avebury, again its significance cannot be overestimated. The barrow has been accurately described as one of the largest and best preserved Neolithic burial chambers in Britain. But that statement does little justice to the full picture. West Kennet is, in fact, the second largest barrow in Britain, being outdone in overall size by the nearby East Kennet Barrow. But as you can see, the East Kennet Barrow lacks the incredible state of preservation 
of its marginally smaller brother. West Kennet is in superb condition for its age and makes a great impact on everyone that visits it. The Wiltshire-born antiquary, John Aubrey, noted the site in 1665. His description of the barrow is scanty to say the least, describing it as about half a yard high and at one end only rude grey weather stones tumbled together. Aubrey's comments give little credit to the incredible achievement of erecting and transporting this massive entrance blocking stone several miles across open countryside. Using primitive rollers and brute force, this 50-ton monster represents a massive amount of work on its own, let alone the rest of the structure. West Kennet Long Barrow is best described as a combination barrow. Being stone chambered only for its first 12 metres or so, then the remainder of its length being an earthen mound. Another antiquary, William Stukeley, made more detailed drawings of the barrow about 60 years after Aubrey, and both men noted that a local doctor, a Dr. Toop or Took, had been regularly digging into the mound to obtain bones for patent medicines. It's possible that the earthen portion of the barrow was divided up in a similar manner to the chambered part, but using wooden hurdles as partitions rather than huge sarsen stones. Details of this are not certain, as the earthen section of the barrow has still not been fully explored. The chalk and earth, which make up the bulk of the barrow, was dug from two parallel ditches, about 10 metres from the mound. In 1859, Dr Thurman revealed the central corridor and large end chamber but it wasn't until 1955 that the four smaller side chambers came to light. Each of these side chambers was complete with its own blocking stone. Inside the barrow, the different chambers are clearly visible. And at the end of the corridor, lies the large end chamber. Despite being in continuous use for about 1500 years, the remains of only 46 people have been found here. Some of them were placed quite carefully in groups, but others were strewn about in a quite haphazard manner. Analysis of the remains has shown that with the exception of one skeleton, none of the remains are intact. It would seem that stress was placed on the burial of long bones or skulls, rather than complete skeletons. In addition to human remains, the barrow contained fragments of over 250 different vessels, which helped identify the time span that the tomb was in use. Despite the best efforts of the good Dr. Took, archaeologists discovered that the remains in the four side chambers had been undisturbed since their interment some 4,000 years ago. So their very incompleteness poses many questions. It has been suggested that the burial rituals of Neolithic man were in fact just that, rituals rather than common burial practices. A few hundred years after West Kennet Long Barrow was built, and within sight of it, work began on yet another significant construction, known today as the Sanctuary. It sits less than a mile to the east of the barrow, and only a shade over a mile from the stone circle. And it's here that archaeologists were able to develop further their theories on Neolithic ritual. People travelling down the busy A4 might be forgiven for being completely unaware of the existence of the sanctuary, as, like Windmill Hill, none of the original constructions remain. All that can be seen beyond this gate are concrete posts placed by modern man to show the original site layout. So what was here? The sanctuary was built in four phases, stretching across several hundred years. Phase one was perhaps a simple wooden hut, four and a half metres in diameter and open to the elements. 
The hut was supported by eight wooden posts arranged in a circle round a central pillar, and it's thought that the dead may have been left exposed for up to two years before final ritual burial of skulls and long bones. Some 300 years later, the original hut was encompassed by a much larger building, about 10 metres across. This time, two circles of posts were used to create the supports for the roof, with the centre being left open to the sky. The third and final building, built about 200 years after that, would have been the most impressive, being some 20 metres in diameter. This time, three circles of posts were needed. Four particularly large posts were probably used to form an impressive entrance to this more elaborate building. The final stage, 200 years on, was to incorporate standing stones actually inside the main structure. And a further circle of stones surrounded the whole monument. Sadly, this vitally important piece of Neolithic history was completely destroyed by a local builder in 1724. But fortunately, not before Samuel Pepys, the celebrated diarist, had seen it in 1668 and likened it to Stonehenge. During the 700 years or so it took to build the sanctuary, the stability of the Neolithic lifestyle allowed the building of yet another colossal monument. The magnificent Silbury Hill. Under a mile to the south of Avebury, Silbury is the closest monument to the stone circle. In common with most of the area's monuments, the exact purpose of Silbury remains a mystery. Many excavations have really only confirmed how it was built, and not why. One thing is certain, however, and that is despite popular legend, it is not a burial mound of any kind. Standing nearly 40 metres tall, Silbury was a truly massive undertaking. It has been estimated that it would take 700 men 10 years to shift the quarter of a million cubic metres of chalk and soil used in its construction. Like the sanctuary, Silbury was built in a number of phases. Initially, gravel, turf and soil was heaped together to make a five metre high mound, held together with wooden stakes. About 200 years later, a large ditch was dug around it and the chalk spoil used to make a conical shape standing 17 metres tall. Before this second phase was complete, it would seem the project was rethought. A ditch of greater circumference was dug, and the spoil from this was used to fill in the first ditch and further enhance the size of the mound in a series of six huge steps. This stepped construction can clearly be seen in another Neolithic mound, Silbury's smaller brother, the close by Merlin's Mount. The larger chalk blocks excavated were used to build retaining walls on each step at an angle of 60 degrees giving great stability to the structure. The steps were then filled with silt and then turfed. The hill is a perfectly symmetrical truncated cone with the top being deliberately left flat, possibly for some form of ceremonial use. Despite its prehistoric origins, fairs were held at Silbury every Palm Sunday right up to the end of the 19th century, drawing hundreds of people from the nearby villages and young lads and lasses who lived in the area and who came to these fairs would climb the hill with short planks of wood which they'd then sit on to slide down the hill again. Climbing the hill may have been marginally easier in Neolithic times as it's possible that a spiral walkway was built as part of the overall construction. From the top, Neolithic man would clearly be able to see all of Avebury's monuments. Just a few hundred yards away is West Kennet Long Barrow, and from there it would have been possible to have seen the hut construction at the sanctuary. Looking the other way, the stone circle could be picked out, and on a clear day, the encampment at Windmill Hill. Not far from Silbury Hill, a further piece of the jigsaw, that is Avebury and its surrounding monuments, can be put firmly in place by the spectacular West Kennet Avenue. Two parallel rows of stones form a winding avenue that links the sanctuary with the great circle at Avebury itself. Originally, the avenue would have consisted of about a hundred pairs of stones, forming a causeway 15 metres wide. 
It seems likely that the avenue was used for ceremonial processions between the two sites. As well as the West Kennet Avenue, there is considerable evidence to support the existence of a second avenue of stones called the Beckhampton Avenue. But now only two long stones remain. Standing somewhat isolated in a field are two large sarsen stones, known today as Adam and Eve. Some people are convinced that there were in fact four avenues, with a possible third avenue linking the henge with the ancient pathway of the Ridgeway, and a fourth leaving the circle northwards, past the Great Lozen Stone, where the Swindon Road leaves the circle. In the early part of the Bronze Age, the peaceful and prosperous times of Neolithic man gave way to more violent times, and use of the stones as a major ceremonial site fell into decline. The Romans may well have visited the site during their occupation of Britain, but by then the stones were already in disuse on a large scale. By the time Christianity came to England, many pagan cultures would already have been well established in the area, but organised use of the stones is not recorded. The early Christian church would have been deeply suspicious of Avebury, regarding it as a pagan temple, and soon set about trying to destroy the site by toppling and burying the stones. Evidence of the medieval destruction of the circle came to light when this stone, known as the Barber Stone, was excavated, and the skeletal remains of a barber surgeon were found, together with some of his instruments and coins in a purse. He was crushed to death when the stone fell on him, apparently toppling a little earlier than was planned. The remains of the barber surgeon were taken to London for further examination and proved unlucky a second time when a World War II bomb scored a direct hit and obliterated them. It was probably during the church's destruction of the henge that demonic connotations were given to some of the other stones in the circle, such as this one at the southern entrance being known as the Devil's Chair and the cove in the northern inner circle being referred to as the Devil's Brand Irons, and the two remaining stones of the Beckhampton Avenue as the Devil's Coits. Mythology and folklore abound from this time, giving rise to lots of stories, like the delightful one told about this stone, known as the Lozenge Stone, or rather less romantically the Swindon Stone, which is reputed to cross the road on the stroke of midnight. Interestingly, Similar stories are told about other stone circles, where, again at midnight, individual stones move about by themselves. The success of Christianity resulted in the circle becoming a forgotten wonder, and the growing village encroached further into the site. The great ditch surrounding the stones was even used as a rubbish dump. Avebury Stone Circle was eventually rediscovered as a significant prehistoric site in 1649 by John Aubrey, who recorded many details for his unpublished Monumentica Britannica. Charles II visited Avebury in 1663 with Aubrey and urged him to further exploration. The Merry Monarch was keen on all the sciences, including archaeology. Throughout the 17th and 18th century, many more of the stones were broken up, this time to provide building material. Fortunately, in 1934, the wealthy Alexander Keeler bought not only the circle and the avenue, but also the manor house, which he made his home, set in lovely gardens. Now the coach house provides a home for the Alexander Keeler Museum, displaying many of the archaeological discoveries from the Avebury area. More than anyone else, Keeler was responsible for the excavations and restorations that have made Avebury what it is today. This magnificent monument will hopefully be preserved in perpetuity as it has been designated a World Heritage Site. And the monuments of the Avebury area are held in guardianship for the nation by English Heritage and managed by the National Trust. There is nowhere else in Britain where you can stroll through the centre of a massive prehistoric stone circle and find yourself walking into a village high street. All the buildings down this end of the high street actually stand inside the circle. The Red Lion can legitimately lay claim to being the only public house inside a stone circle. 
Avebury today is home to some 600 people, who in turn play host to half a million visitors every year. Despite this high number of visitors and the fact that a main road runs through the centre of the circle, the high street itself remains tranquil and the village radiates a restful atmosphere. Avebury has very few shops, but even these are very much in keeping with the spirit of this charming village. The parish church stands well back from the road and, for the superstitious, outside the stone circle itself. At the lower end of the high street, there are a number of charming cottages, all contributing to the ambience of the village. And just a short step from these cottages is a lovely place to sit and unwind with a cup of coffee. Cheers. But what of the monument itself? The stone circle still continues to exert a magnetic appeal for many people and certain ancient rituals and ceremonies are still carried out at key times of the year. And I call for these druids who live in this world on the spirit of the height and the day come join our circle. Hell and well met! Hell and well met! Some might have said. In addition to organised bodies like druids who gather at the stones, informal groups or individuals are drawn to the site for their own private contemplation. And pilgrims of a totally different kind also congregate on a regular basis in large numbers. Throughout the warmer months, the Red Lion acts as a gathering place for the adventurers of today who congregate informally every week. Avebury is truly unique and means many different things to many different people and will long continue to do so. Modern man's best endeavours have enabled us to learn a great deal about Avebury and its monuments. But despite this, there's much about Avebury that remains, as it always has, a complete mystery. <laughs> <laughs>